Jeremiah 17. State of the heart. The revelation of the state of our heart is deep because the heart, how do I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this a certain way. And if you're new here, you will be entertained, but you're gonna learn some things. Um, how do I say this? Our heart is not, when it talks about our heart or the state of our heart, it's not talking about the thing that beats within our chest and pumps blood. It's not your heart. But everybody knows instinctively what it means, religious and non-religious. People know what that means when you say, they'll say, I felt that in my heart. They're, they're, They're trying to identify a sense of a source of something that's deep within them, and the only thing they could think of is, the life-sustaining, blood-pumping, keeping-me-alive heart. Because your heart doesn't feel things. You don't know things in your heart. You understand things in your soulless realm, which is in your mind, in your feelings and emotions. But in the realm of your spirit, your life is or is not. In other words, when a person dies, their spirit leaves or is evicted from their body, thereby vacating the need for the soul, the spirit returns to whom it was created from to be judged. People say, nope, sinners die, they go straight to the pit and they show them ghosts, you know, the little, and the little spirits come and drag them down into the hole. (laughs) But that's not biblically true. After from the bodies to be present with the Lord, the moment that a person ceases to exist, they go before the throne. And they go before the throne to be judged. Not to be judged if they was good or bad, happy, sad, up, down. Do you have the protection plan or don't you? Did you purchase the plan? The lifetime, eternity, protection of your spirit plan. What, 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 how much was, no, I didn't know. You could get, yeah, Christ died for your sins and you purchased that package by your confession in your heart, as the Bible says, if you could believe in your heart. So I begin to kind of think about the heart in two ways. One, the heart that pumps blood, that keeps this body alive. And the other heart, which we refer to as our heart, because it is really the heart of our existence, it's our spirit person or our spirit man. Where without that, your body also falls over. So if your regular heart stops working or your spirit leaves, either way, the body can't exist with either one. So it is your heart, but not in the human blood pumping sense. It's your heart in terms of your very existence is in your spirit man. The difference with your heart is your heart can be transferred. You know, they do heart transplants and they put in somebody else. It's very interesting because the, the, they got to give that person drugs and medicines to keep the body from fighting against and trying to reject that heart because the body goes, I don't know this heart and I don't want it here. So they have to give you medicines to keep the body from trying to attack and destroy the very heart that's been replaced. It doesn't belong here. Um, it's interesting because when I look at the the, 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 the core of my being, being my spirit, my heart from that perspective, there's a place that your heart, your spirit heart, knows it belongs and doesn't belong. Hence you say things like, something told me not to go there. I had a strong feeling that I shouldn't do that. I felt it in my heart. Right, th- th- that's that other heart. It's very much life-sustaining, but this heart has a different ability than the heart that just pumps blood. This heart communicates. This heart has an open communication with the Father consistently all day long. And, 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 And this heart can talk. This heart can tell you when you're doing wrong and when you're doing right. 
and when you're going the wrong way and you're going the right way, even if you don't have a born-again spirit, listen to what I'm about to say. Children, little Timmy was just there. We can look at a child and you can see what I'm saying is true. I've watched little babies go to do something that they're not supposed to do, and they look back. (laughs) They already know before you told them they're not supposed to do that. I would watch my little son. He would take his car, and he would put it on the table, and he would play with it and roll it around and roll it around and keep moving it closer and closer to something. And just before it gets to something that he knows that's not his car, and his hand does this, he'd do that. Okay, I never told you not to touch that. But something did. There's an insight in each and every one of us that knows right from wrong instinctively. Now there's rules and laws that are man's that you learn as you go on. You don't know that's right and wrong. But I'm talking about the core of our existence. We know what God's presence feels like. And we know what the absence of it feels like. One of the biggest, hmm, should I even say this? Medical community might have a problem with me for saying this, but I'm going to say it. I've dealt with a lot of people dealing with depression. Now, sometimes it's possession. Sometimes it's oppression. Sometimes it's just an emotional, overwhelmed feeling of the person. And every time I've dealt with people in that state, I always sense in them the absence of God somewhere in their situation. Hope deferred makes a heart sick. So when you don't feel like God is with you, even if you're calling yourself a believer, or you don't feel like you have God's direction or know what to do with the situation, the next thing that enters in is a feeling of despair depression, confusion, whatever you want to call it, it jumps right in to fill that place because it knows that God's not in it. And here we go. Think about it. You're not confused when you know what God wants you to do. You're not depressed or worried. You might not have any money in your bank account, but if you know in your heart for sure that you're doing what God called you to do, you have a peace that you can't even explain. So, so that feeling comes in when the heart feels that there's a vacancy. How are we doing? So I come to the realization that every time I feel down, any kind of depressed, and I'm not usually a depressed person, but any type of sense of confusion or heaviness, I now immediately check for the vacancy. Somewhere I don't know what God wants or where I'm supposed to be in God right now. Now, now, now this is a very important statement because I want to get to these verses again, but I just really want you to get this because this is going to help somebody. It's going to save somebody's life. I feel like I need to be right here. I'm not talking about just trusting Jesus is going to be okay, baby, and the stuff they tell you in church, just stand on the word, you know, everything going to be all right, and you still, now you're even more depressed because you thought you was trusting in Jesus, and you're still in that state. Okay, so no, I'm not talking about the church cliche of just trust and just be patient, just hold on, baby, to it's always dark, it's for the dawn. No, we're not talking that junk. We're talking that place where I know what God is saying to me right now about my situation. Not the cliches and the church stuff. I sat before God in this situation and did not move until there was clearly, clarity released to my heart about where I am and what I'm doing right now. You got that? In, in other words, I have a responsibility with my heart that nobody else can participate in. That's my responsibility. It's my job to get the answers from God. I'm going to go, Pastor, will you pray for me? I can. But it don't mean nothing 
if I pray and I'm praying and you have not already agreed with what I'm praying or don't agree after I pray. You still have a responsibility after I pray and I could pray and get all church and have bring the organ player in and start bassing the organ for my hey, and all of that stuff. And then you still got to go home. And if you don't leave there with the sense of your heart change, you right where you started or worst. So somebody say, this, say, say out loud, I have a responsibility to guard my heart with all diligence. For out of my heart flows the issues of my life. That's scripture. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. That's your responsibility. I didn't say make yourself feel better, but I need to be able to take this package of whatever I'm feeling confused about and sit before God, listen to me, and refuse to move until I have direction. Hmm. Refuse to move until I have an answer. And refuse to move until God tells me to move. Now, listen to me. I'm speaking to somebody. I know I am. There's times I've gone before God with matters of my heart. And I've said, God, I'm, I'm not. And I'm not talking about I'm going to stay here for five days. And it, Listen, it, I, one thing I learned about God, and I'll go into that a little bit more as we get into the message. If you come to God with a committed heart, it, it won't be long. It don't take five days. It really doesn't. It's really pretty, pretty instant. Once your heart is really in that place that you sat before it to that commit, that commitment is real and you believe it just changes. But, but let's say we're not there yet. I've gone before God with things and God has given me the answer and I got up and my whole life has changed. Excited. Nothing around me has changed. But what I see in my heart has changed. But then there's times that I've gotten before God about things and he didn't give me a specific answer of what he's going to do or what I need to do, what's going to happen. He just gave me a simple, I got you. It's going to be all right. I got it. I heard you. Don't worry. Trust me. I've heard God say things to me like, trust me. And that one trust me from God changed everything that I was going through at that very moment. Amen. Anybody other than me know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Just trust me. And this time I'll say, God, trust you what? What are you going to do? Because <laughs> me and God is cool. I figure I got a right to ask. Okay, I trust you, but can you kind of give a brother a hand? Brother, a little bit, give me a little something. Sometimes he'll say, I'll give you something. Sometimes he'll say, no. Right now, this is an exercise in trust. I'm building your trust muscles. Sometimes I just want you to trust me. And that requires me to then, watch this, in the state of my heart, watch this, willfully, willfully release all thoughts contrary to the word trust me. So my heart's being strengthened. My faith's being strengthened. God just came to, to the, the weight and saw me bench pressing 175, and he said, look, we need to put another 30 pounds on that. You, you, come on. Mm. Trust. Let's go. And knows that I can lift it. Those who ever work with a trainer or a, train, a good trainer, they, they used to say, nah, that's too heavy for me. Like, yeah, yeah. My trainer used to put stuff on me, and he would say, don't turn around, don't look. I don't even want you to look. Just do it. Then I do, and he said, you know what you just left, right? Yeah. The, the, the thing you said last week you couldn't do, or the thing I tried to get you to do last week and you were struggling with, I put it on there without you knowing, and you pushed it right up. Just, listen, don't tell me anymore what you can't lift. Just lift what I give you. That's what God is saying. Stop telling me what you can't lift. Stop telling me what you can't bear and what you can't do and what you can't overcome and what you don't know how to do. Just, just trust me. If I put it on the bar, I know you can lift it. Amen. Different from the suffering message that says God don't put more on you than you can stand. And if you're going through it, you're supposed to go through for Jesus. No, 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 no. God said he don't put nothing on you that you can't lift. He said, I don't 
I won't allow you to be tempted above that which you are able, and with the temptation provide the way of escape. So there's nothing that confronts you that God said, one, you can't even whip it and get rid of it right away, or two, just move on and it's in, in the way of escape and just get out. One or two, escape or stand there and push. A lot of church folk want to just escape everything, or, and then you got the other ones who just want to try to lift everything that they're supposed to be escaping from. Sometimes you're supposed to escape. Did y'all catch that? Yes. There's a time to stay there in bed, and there's a time to escape. Amen. But I sit in front of God, and he'll tell me, you don't need to be in that. Well, God, I'm just trying to hold on and be faithful for you. I ain't never asked you to be faithful. Hang up the phone on that idiot. Don't, don't, and don't take no more of their calls. I want to be a good Christian. Be a good Christian with the phone hung up. <laughs> <laughs> Block the number. Stop giving them money every time they ask you for it. Yeah, I know, but I just want to help. You're not helping. This is escape time. It's time for you to escape. And the church folks said, Amen. did that help somebody? So I have a responsibility to bring my heart before God. I have a responsibility not only to bring my heart before God, but in every situation. So just those of you who are sitting here today, if you're dealing with any level of of discouragement or depression that only comes from an absence of God's presence in that situation. You don't know what God's saying to you there. If you did, that feeling would go away right away. Who in this room bears witness with what I'm talking about? Amen. Amen. That was the end of the message. Have a good day. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I think that was good enough. Listen. <laughs> I'm filled. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> the powerful thing about that revelation and that relationship. Hmm. How do I want to put this, Father? As we're learning, we know that we have the responsibility now for the state of our heart. It's either submitted or it's not. Sometimes it's half submitted. Like you give your heart to God partially, but then there's a part of you out of fear or past disappointments or whatever that you hold on to a part of it and still try to manipulate it in your way. And then you try to manip manipulate God to go on along with the flow of your heart. And then time goes on and you come to this realization, he's not going to do it. He wants it all or you get it all but you don't get to do the half and half thing. I want to forgive them, but I want to make sure they don't get a chance to do it to me again. So I want to stay a little bit bitter and a little bit cold and a little bit defensive and a little bit heartless. Yeah. You need to pray if that's a stay or get out situation. Because if you're going to feel like that, just end the relationship and go your own way and don't look back. But don't stay there and carry that because that's on you. Hmm. So the responsibility to bring my heart before God and allow God to change it is not only building up my faith, is not only building up my trust, are you listening? It's a very, very important part to this that excited me when God began to show it to me as we begin to do this message about the state of the heart. Of course, I've been dealing with the state of the heart off from the, last, from the last message all the way through and probably for the past couple of years off and on. I'm just going directly at the heart right now. It's relationship building. It allows me to have a relationship with God that supersedes anyone else in their relationship with God. Think about what I just said. What I just said in my own words is, my relationship with God is better than yours. Did you get that? And your relationship with God is better than mine. Did you catch that? You, 
the fact that God gives me the right and, and the privilege to bring my heart before him so that he can work with me specifically. That's like having my own on-call surgeon 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and I can come and surrender to him at any time, and I don't need you, and I don't need you, and I don't need you, and I don't need you. I don't need any of you there. I don't need, really need you to pray. You can pray if you want to. I don't need you all to come and get together with me and try to hold me up and hold me up. I'm going through. Just hold me up and stand for me and believe the Lord with me. You know, I don't, need, I don't need all of that. I can go to God myself, and I can sit down with God myself. Then I can get the answer from God myself. Then I can come back to your monkey behind and say, okay, this is what I got from God, and you can agree with me because I already have my answer. Amen. That's crucial that you can boldly go before the throne of grace to receive help in the time of every need. That's, that's, we spend so much time playing church and religion and get the prayer group and prayer circle and prayer octagon, oval. I don't need none of that junk. I don't. Do You say I don't have people pray? Yes. I have people pray after I pray and I talk to God and I get clarity and I get an answer and then I come to you and tell you this is what I heard stand in agreement with me. That's who you are though. That's the right and privilege that you have. That you can walk up to the most powerful creative being in all of this universe in time and sit down and have a one-on-one. -on -one. Bust right in on this calendar. You having a meeting right now? Okay, well, separate yourself. You're able to do that. You're omnipresent. S send one of you out and let's sit down. Send, send my God out. Send the God who died for me out. Yeah, send my God. Not the God who died for the world. Right. You can stay in the meeting. Send the one out that died for me. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 I have a right to give him my heart. And it's my responsibility to do that. He won't take it. He won't force his will on your heart. He won't force you to change. He won't force you to be better. He won't force you to do anything. But you have the right to take advantage of all of those privileges that belong to you. And it's amazing to me, amazing to me. I know this is a side journey, but I'm making a point. It's amazing to me how we sit in this country and we don't know any of the things. I need money for this. I don't know, I'm trying to go to school. I'm trying to raise this kind of money. I'm trying to do this. And then people come from foreign countries, they learn everything. They're they paying for their rent. They're paying for them to eat Cheerios. They're paying for their gas and light and for their swimsuit and for their, for their car and gas. Because they done looked up all the benefits of being in this country and all the stuff that you can get to help you out. And they done found out how to do it all. And they come in and get full run scholarships and triple masters and doctorate degrees and they still living comfortable and they had a job yet and you're sitting here trying to figure out how to eat and that's the state of the church folk you ain't looked in your benefits package you don't even know what's due to you you wait for some preacher to stand up there with his half educated behind and tell you what God want for you ha, I think I see something huh I see God, hey, hey, see, de, 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 hey, I see, you know, God told me to tell you to bring an offering, huh? a special offering, and God, really? So that's what you want to do. you just rather pay for it. I didn't plan to stay on this this long, but God did, so here we are. Jeremiah 17. We went through most of this last week, but let's pick up some of it and let's go forward. Um, I'm going to pick up at verse 4. No, because then I leave some of it. Let me see. Let me go back. I'm going to go right back to the heart. No, let me, let's, let me start back from one and we'll just read through. The sin of Judah is written down as an, with an iron stylus with a diamond point engraved upon the tablets of their hearts, the sin, and on the horns of their altar, 
as they remember their children, so they remember in detail their pagan altars and their ashram. Now, I looked up ashram, and it's a goddess. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a goddess carved out of wood that they chose to worship. And so he said their sins or their nature of sin in them was engraved in their heart and on their altars or their pagan altars. And, and so basically God said the sin was not only written in their heart, but it's also written in the, in the things and in, in the manner in which they worship their church life or their church beliefs. He said the sin is engraved in it and it's engraved in it so deep and so thorough that they live this life thinking that they're living a right life, but the, 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 the immoralness of their sin is carved into them in a way that is just normal. You know, okay, as they remember their children, so they remembered in detail their pagan altars and their ashram beside the green trees and on the high hills. O Jerusalem, my mountain and my countryside, I will give to the Babylonians as the course for your sin, he's saying, I will take this, your, your blessings and the things due to you, and I will give it to the heathen nation for you. He goes on to say, your wealth and all your treasures as plunder. And they, they sure take it in plunder. And throughout your territory and the high places of sin. And you, through your own fault, will let go of your grip of your inheritance that I gave you. And I will make you serve your enemies in the land in which you do, know not, you do not know. For you have kindled my anger, which will burn forever. So let's pick up this four. I covered the beginning of it last week. It's online for free. You can go check it. But I, I, I ended on this, and I want to pick this up. And through your own fault, and you through your own fault will let your grip go on your inheritance that I gave you. So let's, let's pick that up. He talked about your heart. He talked about the sin of your heart. And he talked about the unwillingness to deal with your heart. Now, I covered all of that in the first half hour, so I won't deal with that. We already know that it's our responsibility to take our heart before God and have it purged or cleaned or dealt with. How many of us bear witness with that? How many of you learned something new about that today? Good. Now, he's saying... As a result of the sin engraved on your heart, we covered last week is where we wrapped up, and the sin engraved on your altar or your style or the way you've chosen or figured out you worship, that it will cause you to let go of the blessings or the, or the inheritance due you of your own free will. This statement is heavy in so many ways. I could preach on that for the next three months. Because when I looked at the state of the church, I came up, thank God I wasn't raised in the church, but I got saved when I was in my 20s, so that's still been a long time, over 30, 40 years in church. And in the beginning, I kept hearing all these stories about the suffering you got to go through, the hard times you got to accept. And I know when I got saved, I didn't get saved in church, and I won't go through the whole story, but I got saved in the living room, the Lord appeared to me, and as I was seeking God in every religion, I was trying to find God in everything, and he appeared to me. My point is this. I would hear this message preached and would grieve my spirit. It would grieve my heart. It went against the God that I had met in person. But everybody was saying it, so at some point I concluded that I must be wrong and they all must be right. How many of you have learned since you've been here, here not to accept those evil reports about God and what he wants for you? So, upon accepting that lie, my life immediately went from a place of comfort to a place of depression and confusion in every term of my walk. Still, church. Now I'm, before I had this relationship, I wasn't in church. Now I'm in church, and God sucks. But I got to put up with him because I don't want to go to hell. Oh, well. He's abusive. I thought God was Ike Turner. 
Well, that's the way he talked about well, those who haven't seen this movie. You know? you know, I thought he was beating me up and just saying, you bitch, you better take it. I only do it because I love you. Mm, mm. No, you're saying, mm, but right? Isn't that what the, what the overall message went out was? Now, now, let me tell you why this scripture comes to play. He said, because of the sin engraved in the horns of your altar, your, your worship or your worship style, you will surrender, turn over your own inheritance. Basically, the inheritance of blessed coming in, blessed going out, you know, a thousand fall at your left hand, but not at your, it will not come near you because you are blessed and covered in the presence of the Lord. I released that like all of us did and turned that over and accepted the package of Satan that I should go through the suffering that his children go through because I gave my inheritance up by way of my horns of my altar. I surrendered it. I received the lie. Pastors are leading people straight to hell. No, they not. You, your responsibility is to take your heart before the Lord. And something inside of me, something told me. I had a feeling deep down inside. All those sayings was like, they not telling the truth. This is wrong. So I kept studying and I kept reading and I kept looking. Then I come back and I sit down with the pastors and I ask them again. Okay, so you saying it's supposed to be this. Yeah. Then why does this scripture say this? Well, see now, brother, you don't truly understand. The full. Like, don't, don't, we don't need to understand the full thing. Explain away this. That goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That no evil shall be for the righteous. Explain that. Don't tell me what I need to understand to circumvent this. And it got to the point that I don't think I had a pastor that could tolerate me. They just got, I just got on their nerves. Because you're demanding that I give up my inheritance freely without a fight. But there's a fight in me. And that fight in my heart says, I can't let it go like that. So I fought and I stood and I stood and I fought and I fought and I stood until God said, okay, good. Now you had enough of these jerks. Let me take you and show you what I'm trying to teach you. Now, as I begin to study the word more, I've realized something, and we talked about this last week. He said you will willingly let go of your inheritance. You're listening to me? Yeah. Willfully let it go. By your own deception, you'll let it go. You'll give up and walk away from things that you should have never give, given up or walked away from. Somebody could say amen. amen. You know there's things you walked away from that you shouldn't have walked away from. But enough people told you you should, and you did. Another people, enough people told you, to, you know, God, he can heal, but not like that, though. That's a figure of speech. It's not, it's not like he, you know. And what does it really matter? You're going to have eternal life when you die. So we say, okay. And we let go of inheritance. So understand this. Your health, your wisdom, your prosperity, the direction in a one-on-one -on -one encounter and relationship with God, those are your inheritances. They belong to you. They are the children's bread. It belongs to you. And that's why when you read in Ecclesiastes, when he said, I've seen a sore evil in the world. Sore evil. Princes walking like slaves and slaves riding horses like princes. He said, I've, way back then, I, it's a, he says, it's a sore evil. He didn't say it's a bad thing. He said, it's evil that you've allowed yourself to be replaced by the very heathen. That's what this word is saying right here. It's turned over to them. Now they rule over you, and you work for them, and you got to know if it's okay for you to put your cross up on your thing or play your Christian music at your job, even though everybody else is playing their trap all around and singing whatever lyrics they want to sing. You better not sing no Jesus song on your job. You might lose your job. Why? Because you turn, we turn our inheritance over. We supposed to run this. They're supposed to work for us. Imagine if there would be any argument about what's legal and what's not legal in terms of whether you can hire somebody who does this or does that or whatever if it was in the order it was supposed to be. What if every heathen in the world had to come to believers for a job? Right. 
It's just so unfair. And that's not unfair. You gave it up. We gave it up. We surrendered it willfully. Now, it doesn't take a lot of us to turn it around, but it does take people willing to go against everything now that comes off as normal or regular. You with me? So let's talk about this. Let's keep going. Thus says the Lord, Curse is the man who, who trusts and relies on mankind, making weak, faulty human flesh his strength, and whose mind and heart turn away from the Lord. Here we go again. Your mind, your heart, turn away. Again, we're not talking about your flesh beating heart. We're talking about your sense of the core of your spirit, your being of life. For he will be like a shrub in a parched desert and shall not see prosperity when it comes. 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 comes. What comes? He didn't say, and because you surrendered and because you've hardened your heart, And because you've turned away, you will never prosper. Church has said that. He says, no, I'm a God of prosperity. God don't know how to do anything but prosper. You you didn't catch that. I said this last week. You've never seen a Bible where God says, you are cursed, his children. He said, because of your actions, you will be cursed. Or you will live in the curse. But God doesn't pronounce the curse on his children. And, and, and proof of that is this. If, if, you, if, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're searching your mind, no, he does curse us somewhere. Of course you are, because you've turned over your birthright. So you believe that. But di- didn't, didn't Balaam clearly say, I can't curse that which God has blessed? Yes. He did say that, right? Oh, they, weren't, they, he, they weren't even living right, but he still said, but I can't curse that which God has blessed. So, so if, 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 if the word clearly reports that he doesn't curse what he blesses, you wind up cursed by your decisions and by your ignorance, but not by God's choice. And the proof of this is this verse. And I started on it, and I want to say it again. He said, you won't see prosperity when it comes. So even in your cursed state, it's still going to show up. Ooh, I never heard you get this excited. <laughs> it still comes. Look at somebody say, it still comes. So, 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 so let, me, let me give you something that should make you real excited. Ready? Go home this week and look around for, for the prosperity that probably came and you just ain't seen it yet. He said it comes. He, said, he didn't say it comes, I take it back. He said it comes. You just don't see it. Because of the state of your own foolish heart, you miss it. Because of your altars and the sin engraved in your heart and on your altars and the way you worship, you don't even see it. God blesses anyway. You think not? Do you, you ever woke up in the morning and God said, no oxygen for you? <laughs> Everybody else gets oxygen, but I'm not pleased with you, so you don't get that. It's right there. He causes the rain to fall and the sun to shine and the just and the unjust equally. It's right there. But they see it, and they take it, and they live off of it, and we miss it. So that means the iPads that you're sitting with today, they were sitting right up there in the realm of the spirit. And some religious believer in his self-righteous beliefs missed it, and Steve found it. It was there for the taking. You think it was only there? You think all these great inventions and all these buildings and all these major corporations, God just built them for the heathen? That that wisdom to create all of these phenomenal ideas, that was just not, not for you. You just go to song and sing Jesus songs. You, just, you sing Jesus songs in church. You don't mess with that. That ain't for you. But then you do get a, go to school and try to get a job there, though. 
But you're not supposed to create that. These countries, these companies are worldly companies. Only because they took what the scripture said, what we left. It came, we didn't see it. Am I, am I messing with you a little bit? How many, how, how many of you are old enough to remember when the church said television was the devil's tool? You ain't old enough to, you probably heard it, you ain't old enough to remember that. I remember preachers, I remember they, the preachers wouldn't let their family have a TV in their house. They kept one in the basement so they could sneak down there and watch it. But they used to say the TV would belong to the devil. That's the devil's tool, the one-eyed monster. That's what they called it. Yeah, it was the devil's tool. Watch this. And by the confession of their own mouth, they turned it over to him. I'm like, wait a minute. I look back some now at the TV. I'm like, you ever saying that about Lassie? What? Flipper and Lassie and really? This is, this, this is what you had a problem with? Now look at it. By the, yeah, the three stooges. By the, by, the, by, the, by the speaking of your own mouth, the church surrendered it. You may not remember that, but I can tell you, I can tell you one you all remember. When the internet first came out, the church said the same thing. They said it. That's the devil. Oh, this is the devil. It's porn on there. It's the devil. And they spoke it and spoke it and spoke it and spoke it. And again, every opportunity of God missed by the church. This is what it says. It'll come. You won't even see it. Okay, I didn't plan to go here, but I guess this is where I'm going. If it helps you, I'll go there. Let's stop and reflect on ourselves for a minute. Let's stop making it broad and making it the church. Let's pinpoint ourselves. How many people in this room, by honest show of hands, to say there are things I believe God called me to do in life, but I didn't pursue it with my heart and I felt uncomfortable because I felt the church would frown at me? How would the church look at it? There's many things I knew that God called me to do. I'm like, but you're a pastor, though. But they, you know, they going church folk going to say something. Think about that. Think about things that you would probably normally do, but you've been so brainwashed to believe that God don't have the ability to work with you there that you won't even touch it. Now, I'm not talking about being a drug dealer or a prostitute and stuff like that. I'm talking. I'm talking about if he told you not to do that, they were right. <laughs> but, but I'm talking about, come on, there are things that you know you call to do. She's sitting here, she got her jeans on with holes all in it. You know you ain't going to go to no other church like that. You walk in the door, they call you a little floozy Jezebel as soon as you walk in the door. It's jeans with holes in them. She's not showing on private. If she has shorts, what's the difference? But my, my, my thing, <laughs> my ch- the church is so into saying what's not God, they don't even know what is God. We know what's not. <laughs> it's a fact, right? But I can't blame the pastors. We have the responsibility. None of this here is talking about a church. It's talking about the individual, when he says Israel, in their heart. Israel is the people, not the group of people, but the individual people. He's saying this is the state of your heart. I'm blessing you, but because of the foolishness of your beliefs, even because you're arrogant and stubborn and you're stuck in your ways, or because you've been deceived into believing you're beneath something, you feel like you have a low self-esteem and you don't deserve it. And some of the people, and I'm going to say this here, and some of you may not like it, but it's true. Some of you that are the cockiest and got the strongest seeming attitudes are the most insecure people in this house. All that's a front to cover up the fact that you don't believe you, you were for that. Because if you was all that you say you were, you would have everything you say you have. 
You wouldn't even have to say it. Your bank account would say it and everything around you would say it. So we spend a lot of time trying to be religious, trying to conform to religion, trying to conform to each other, trying to look good in front of each other, but never ever taking the time to surrender the, 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 the badly engraved heart in a horrible engraved altar and getting a heart transplant and receiving the heart you need so that when the blessings and the prosperity comes, you don't miss it. It comes, but it does come. But it has come. Yes? yes? Opportunities, they have come. Yes. They do come. Yes? yes? They come again. Yes? yes? Well, maybe the Lord just didn't want me to have that. Do, I don't think the Lord is sitting up in heaven saying, you know what? I don't think you, you should have that job. God will let you have whatever job you want. You'd be miserable there. But I've never seen how he going to tell you you got a free will, but you can't have that job. No, it's your heart, your state. Now, if you, let me do that alone. Let me just get back to these scriptures. For he shall be like a shrub in a parched desert, drying out trees. But you shall live in the rocky places in the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed with, I'm reading from the Amplified, by the way, with spiritual, with spiritual security. Blessed with spiritual security. See the opposite? Yes. Do you see that? Blessed with spiritual security is the man who believes and trusts in the Lord and relies on the Lord and whose hope and confidence and expectation is in the Lord. Take that verse. Blessed with spiritual security. Not, it's not so, it, didn't, it didn't focus on the, the worldly or even not seeing the prosperity, which is a natural thing when it comes, and the spiritual thing. But he goes on to say, blessed with spiritual security is a man who believes in trust and relies on the Lord. So he's saying spiritual soundness, are you listening? Affords everything else correct. In other words, Quick example, people who win the lottery and the state of their soul is still poverty and they run through all the money and they wind up broke again. If you think that I'm making this up, I've become a fan recently of Unsung. How many are familiar with Unsung? Mm -hmm. Only a few of you. It's, it's, it's kind of like a behind the music show for people who didn't become as big as the people you know and see on TV all the time. And it tells their stories of all these artists. So you can look up all these people that, it was so many of them, I looked up, I was like, oh wow, they had platinum records? I didn't, even, I didn't even think they was that big, right? Groups that went out and they did this thing and they became super successful. And we listened to them on the radio and we listened to their music and we bought their music and boy, we probably sat back, some of us who have creative talents, and we envied them. And we just pictured in our mind them just living on yachts every day and sipping back on mimosas and just having a good life and just living, just living just this life. And then you come to find out after watching the show that most of them were broke and couldn't pay their bills. And their lives usually ended miserably. Killed in the street, making a drug deal, or some stupid crap. And you look at these stories, how many of them end tragically with them broke with nothing to show for all the success that you admired and loved them for. All they got out of it was a mad woman spree and some drug use. Most of them ended, they didn't even have houses and stuff. And, and, and I'm talking about groups that were big groups. And I sat there and I said, wow. Wow. So even with your gifts, without having that relationship with God, this was your outcome. And it always amazes me when they show old groups. I, I don't want to journey off too far, but it just blows, it blows my mind. I'm watching them, and they're showing the members, and they're telling their horror stories, 
how bad their life went. Now I'm driving a truck. Now I'm trying to do real estate. Well, now he just died alone in his room. And then there's always the camera gets on one. And he always looks good. Don't even look the age. Smiling. I say, he going to say he's a believer. Right away, I say, he's going to say he's a believer. Watch. He said, yeah, you know. And now, and they put on, now he's a minister of such and such church. I'm like, look. They found their way to the light. They said, okay, listen, I ain't trying to keep getting my life stolen from me. I'm going to turn my life over to the king where it belongs. Some of them say, no, I still do music. I still travel. But I gave my life to the Lord. And I'm like, yep, and the age ain't on you. And the looks of the drugs ain't on you. And you, and you look happy. And there you are with your kids and your wife and your grandkids. And look at you. As soon as they face come up on the screen, I'm like, oh, he got saved. <laughs> or he was saved and he went back and gave his life to the Lord. Am I telling the truth, Mary? Right? It's the truth. As soon as they put their face on the screen, I'm like, he got saved. Right, he said, he got, he, before he started talking, I'm like, Dag, you all, I'm like, oh, you, you got saved. You got saved. So I'm saying this spiritual security, hmm, be a wise guy, is better than social security. <laughs> they don't run out of money and you get your benefits. This There's a verse in the New Testament that goes something like this. Lay up not for yourself treasures on earth where thieves break through and steal and where moth corrupt. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where thieves cannot steal it and nor does moth corrupt it. And what he's talking about here is that, that spiritual security, where your heart's in God, not in the world on the world's things. Yeah, you live in the world, but you're not of it. But you're supposed to succeed. Look at somebody say, you're supposed to succeed. You're supposed to succeed. You're supposed to win. You're supposed to win. Say it to somebody. You're supposed to win. You're supposed to win. Say, oh, let me make it better. Say, God wants you to succeed and win. Now, I, I, that should help somebody. That ha- that should, wait a minute. That should help somebody. Because, no, 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 no. Stay with me. Stay with me. Don't just say amen. Pay close attention to what I'm about to say. Because it's been sown into your spirit for so long that God don't want you to win. For a long time. He wants you to go through it. Sweet pie in the sky by and by. Milk and honey in heaven. I'm like, I got milk and honey. I can go to the grocery store. I don't want to go through all this to get some milk and honey. I may have been poor, but I have food stamps. I could buy milk and honey. <laughs> My point is, he wants you to win. But we trade it for the world. And that's why it says in the verse before, Curse is the man who trusts and relies on mankind, making weak, faulty human flesh his strength. Then we drop back down to seven. He says, blessed with spiritual security is the man who believes and trusts and relies on the Lord and whose hope and confidence and expectation is in the Lord. For he will nourish you like a tree planted by the rivers of living water. So I'm going to wrap up on this because this is, we're coming to the end of my time, and this is a good place to bring it home. So he gave an example before he said, cursed is the man who trusts in in, in the strength and the arm of man. He said like a parched tree. So he's making comparison. So trusting in the arm of man, trusting in the arm of your own strength, you find yourself in like a, a, a tree in the wilderness. You're parched, there's no water, you're drying out. But then he says, the man who trusts and relies on the Lord, he goes back to this tree example. It's a tree by living water, flourishing, succeeding. So here's my thing. It's not about the struggle that you do. It's about where you plant it. Let me, let me bring that home for you. It's not about how hard you think you worked or how many hookups you think you made and how many people. No, he said, it's about where you plant it. If you plant it in a place where you're trusting in your own flesh and your own image and the way people see you and the way you see people and your own connections and what you think people can do for you, he said you're going to be a dry tree. 
There's never going to be enough nourishment for you. He didn't say you're going to die. He said you'll be a, you'll be a starving tree, though. He didn't say you will waste away, but he said you're going to always be in drought. Somebody knows what I'm talking about today. He said, but if your heart and your trust and your whole commitment is in the Lord and his spiritual security, now you're a tree planted by living water. See, trees don't have to get up and move around and find the water. If you plant it by it, it's there. And if you're not, you're not. If you're in the desert, you're in the desert. But if you're planted by rivers, rivers of living water, then you continue not only to live, it says, but to flourish. That's to grow, to keep extending branches and keep getting bigger and more lush. So the key is this. I started by saying it. I'll end it by saying it. We'll pick it up next week. It is my responsibility, though. I have the right to decide where I'm planted with my own heart. I have the right. See, the tree don't have a choice. It's planted wherever man puts it. But I have a choice where I plant my own heart. I have a choice on how I choose to grow and live and gain my sustenance. I choose to be either filled with life or struggling and existing. I choose that. God didn't choose that for you. So if you're struggling, if you're going through depression, if you're going through confusion, I'm here to let you know, listen to me, listen to me, and listen to me. God didn't make that choice. You did. Maybe intentionally, maybe unintentionally, maybe ignorantly, maybe whatever. The state of your situations and your affairs right now is not God trying to show you nothing. You made choices. Intentionally or unintentionally, you made choices. But by God's grace, the, the, the prosperity continues to come. The inheritance still shows up. He says it does. You just don't see it when it comes. But he's always extending to you the olive branch. He's always extending you the opportunity to make it better. He's always, that's why he said, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all men liberty and a braided knot and it should be given to him. He said, if you look for it, it's going to always be there for you. God never says no to anybody. I don't care how bad a state your life is in and how long you've been away from God and how long you, if you've never even walked with God in your life. I was a total atheist when I decided to seek God. I didn't believe in none of it. But I decided to seek. And God, boy, did he show me. Like I said, I was doing good until I joined church. Then it, it all went south. Because they started filling me with all the religious perspectives. I'm not saying it all went bad. I learned a lot of stuff. But I also learned a lot of stuff that kind of took away the relationship and gave me religion. So one of the things I do here all the time is try to push you to the relationship. Don't shun the relationship. And I don't care how bad you think your life is and how much sin you think is in your life or how wrong you think you are, you are never too wrong that you can't go to God with an honest heart and he not answer you and give you direction. He promises to do that. He promises to do that. There's nothing you in that he can't bring you out. He promised that. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but I'm telling you. Yes, I do. I know who I'm talking to, but I'm but I'm gonna act like I don't. But I know I'm talking to you, sis. But I'm telling you. Now I'm looking. I'm looking right over here, so you don't have to think I'm. But I'm. Yes, I'm talking to you. Yeah, you just said who me? Yes, you. I'm talking to you. Yes. So my point is this: There's no place that you are that's unreachable, but it's not found through religion and it's not found through church sayings. It's found through you and him getting together, total exposure of your heart to him. In no sense lying. He already knows. In no sense going to God try to fake. He knows all of it. And he can turn. But, but I, what about the things I've been through? Forgetting those things which are behind us. See, you learn how to do all of that. Forgetting those things which are behind me, I press forward to the market high calling. I was abused as a child. I was beaten and knocked around and punched around, all kind of stuff. I grew up with hatred and rage in me. I went to the street. I became like an animal. But I'm going to tell you this, God turned me around. Amen. Amen. He did. Amen. And I don't live out of that hurt anymore. Hey. That's, that's, that's so far in my yesterday. I have, to, I have to try to make myself feel that hurt. I, I don't feel that. I watch shows on TV and I see that kind of stuff. It don't make me go back, oh, that reminds me of when I, no, it's like, 
Yeah, I just go, yeah, I remember that. Before I got delivered. So you can stay who you are. Or you can be what you're supposed to be. In every step of the way, I don't care how old or how young you are, you can give your life to God and have him turn it around again. And again. And again. And again. And I love the fact that no matter how right I think I am, and how far I think I've come, there's another level for me. And that keeps me excited, keeps me from getting bored. I can be a better man. I can be a better, uh, have a better relationship with God. I can have a newer heart. No matter how old I get, I can keep getting a new heart transplant. And I can keep getting my heart updated. And I love it when the updates come and it flashes in my spirit and it says, click here to download the latest update. I get it right in. I don't even want to wait. Because I want to continue to be everything God has called me to be until I leave this place. And when I transition out of here, and that's what I want to do, transition out. I don't want to be evicted. <laughs> and when I get transitioned out of here, I want to get out of here knowing that every, every opportunity that I found to be better in him, I took it. Amen.